realizing it when he's... Did you read about that? I did read about that, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll do that. We'll talk about Switch Pressing at Wendy's when we play the Wendy's RPG. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, we the, we I, was, the Grim Dark Media I was driving by RPG. Wendy's the other day at lunchtime, and I was going to get a burger, but I thought, oh, man, there's cars in line. I can't afford a burger right now. That's right, yeah. There's too many cars there. It's going to go up a dollar. <laughs> this Baconator is going to be twice as expensive. And yes, hey, everybody, there is a Wendy's RPG, and it's amazing. I think Feast it was, of Legends. Feast of Legends, <laughs> yeah. I believe you can find the free PDF online still. Um, it's a, it's it's probably the most grim dark thing I've ever seen in a certain way. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's if you've ever seen like I think it was a Family Guy episode where uh, like all the McDonald Lands characters come to life and they're like how are you how are you talking your head is just made out of dead cow dead cow meat <laughs> yeah, that's right bun that's as grim dark as it gets <laughs> well hey everybody welcome to the grim dark media we're back today with a JPEG this is probably the most JPEG and how it's funny because in researching this you and I both discovered there was things we didn't know about yeah and I was surprised like I usually. You know, like I usually have the attitude that even if I've done something for a long time, there's always layers to it that I don't know. But because this thing existed for such a short time and has such a small amount of total content, I'm like, no, nah, I, I, I've been here for 40 years. I, I know everything about this. Nope. And this is funny because this is the year in my generational gap here because this came out the year I was born. So I never consumed this on TV. Shut up. I'm just. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Fuck me, right? But, but but this is one of the things where I missed this you because... fucking kids with your gray beards, <laughs> your glasses. I know why you look younger than me. I don't understand. But but like the fact that you were able to actually catch this on television yeah. and, and, and it only ever aired until 83. So I never saw this on TV. I saw this later in life as like a as like a a, a curiosity right. right where you actually like experienced this at the time. And we talked about this a bit off camera and we'll we'll get into this as we go through. We should say what it is. No, no. <laughs> this is Thunder the Barbarian. Thunder the Barbarian. <laughs> but the but the thing that's interesting about it is if you watched it at the time, you watched it at the time, whatever. If you watched it after the fact, it can be a little difficult to contextualize where it falls relative to certain other pieces of media because it feels like it should be following on certain other things that it preceded. Yep. It's it's an interesting piece it's in terms of than. where it where it falls in the timeline. Okay. So this aired in 80. Yep. And then there's a second season that aired in 81. Correct. And I thought this was a Hanna-Barbera show, and it's not. It's not. It's made by two people who left Hanna-Barbera and went to Hollywood. So this is an American show. I thought this was a Canadian show. No, and they very left Hanna-Barbera. <laughs> but this is why I didn't catch it in syndication, because here in Canada, we would see Space Ghost and like the Nelvana Hanna-Barbera stuff like... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Pink Panther and um, Scooby, uh, not Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo wasn't Hanna-Barbera. It was um, uh, Yogi Bear. Like all that stuff would be, yeah. it was Canada's Wonderland. It was a Hanna-Barbera themed yeah. amusement park, basically like Disneyland. So contrary to what you thought, Thunder is not in fact a Hanna-Barbarian. No, he's not so. a Hanna-Barbarian. Oh, we can't make that joke, but you did it anyway. You I, did. It in. I did. I um, did. It's so not then, just for my fighting fantasy game. <laughs> it's true. So get, give us the skinny on this. What's the background of this show? Yeah, so Thunder of the Barbarian is a. I'm not going to go through all the adjectives that you went through earlier. It's a uh, six adjectives, but it is, but it is a, it is a fantasy sci-fi show, post-apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic fantasy sci-fi yeah. show. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they they did future-proof themselves better than some other sci-fi shows. So instead of being set in like the far future of like 1997 or something like that, it is set nominally in the year 3994. Um, so I, I don't think we have to worry about people like looking outside and going, it's not like that. We'll, we'll catch up to it. Yeah, we'll catch, we'll up, to catch it. up to it. Um, so it is set in the year 3994. It also pulls the awesome trick of being a post-apocalyptic set show where no matter how much you have decided to imagine uh, projecting social or political values onto the apocalypse, there's none of that here. So the apocalypse is created by a comet passing between the earth and the moon tearing the moon in half yep. um, and then this disrupts the tides and everything goes bad. So it has nothing to do with anything. There's no parable to the real world. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a global catastrophe. It's great. Yeah. It's you beautiful. can, you can have an apocalypse. that's basically like it's, it's morally free of any, yes. like, anybody's like fault basically. Yeah. You, you can have, you can in fact have things go wrong just because things go it's wrong. It's a fun apocalypse. It's yeah. a fun apocalypse. It's fun yeah. apocalypse. Really. It's fun apocalypse. So <clears throat> the setting for the show because it's set again nominally in the year 3994, is pre-apocalypse was significantly technologically far more advanced than we are now, mm -hmm. um, which you see in the episodes as you go on, as you get, you know, angry villagers and shredded rags with torches and pits 
pitchforks chasing robots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> damn robots, get them out of here. Damn robots, like guys with cyborg arms, all kinds yeah. of stuff. Um, so the world that we currently live in, the world of Thunder the Barbarian, um, basically there's no overriding political system, government. So you have all of these smaller communities, fiefdoms, warlord warlordness warlordish sure. yeah yeah whatever uh, i was gonna say um like it five times works but like uh you have these like little baronies and yeah and, like sort of like and the, the head of each of these baronies is a wizard wizards are bad yeah. just all the wizards are bad all wizards are bad all the it's time it's like dark sun it is it <laughs> it's is. always just all the all the, all the wizard kings basically it's actually very like dark sun because <laughs> one of the one of the things that's shocking for an 80s tv show one of the things that underscores the fact that wizards are bad is they're almost all slavers. Yeah. Right. Like, ev- like all of your pockets of humanity, all of your, all of your innocent villagers that Thundar and his friends are helping out. They're almost all people that are just trying to evade being enslaved mm-hmm. by these wizards. And it's a road show. They basically like are, it's almost a, a it's wagon A-team. train. It's an 18. It's yeah, the 18. It's, so they, they, they yeah. journey, they journey from town to town helping the locals fighting If you can crime. find them, if they can help. If, if you can find, find them, if they can help. The Thunder team. So basically the best way to sum up Thunder of the Barbarian is it's a hybrid between the A-team and the Littlest Hobo. Mm. If you were to put those two shows together. The Littlest Ookla. <laughs> the Littlest Ookla. <laughs> oh, mock. Oh, mock. Um, so the protagonists of the show, our main character, our titular character is Thunder the Barbarian. Uh, what kind of backstory do we get for him? Like, where is he from? Where does he go? So we'll get to that when we yeah, get okay. to the third character. Okay. So Thundar is a barbarian. Yeah. Um, Ukla is a mock. Obviously, everybody watching this or listening to this knows what a mock is. Yeah, it's a mock. It's a mock. Yeah, it's um, like a it's 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 a knockoff <coughs> Wookiee. It's what it is. He's he's a big <laughs> bipedal lion man that even the creator of the show in an interview referred to as the Wookiee like creature. Yeah, he's just a Wookiee. <laughs> um, and the third companion is Princess Ariel. Mm-hmm. Princess Ariel is a sorceress, and her father is an evil wizard. So the backstory on Ukla and Thundar is they are former slaves yep. that she freed, and then the three of them went on the run together. Which, now that I'm saying it out loud, it's like they escaped from a military prison together and then joined the Los Angeles underground. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I think she's George Papard she in this situation. Papard, yeah. Well, I, she's also got like heavy princess Leia vibes, even like the armament that Thundar has. He's kind of a cross between Han Solo and, and Luke Skywalker. Cause he's a bit naive. He's got a laser he's sword. A bit he's got a laser sword. Yeah. There's, <clears throat> there's like the fact that this came out in 80 and 79 is what? 78 is Star Wars? 77, 77, is, Star Wars. 77 Wars. is Star Wars. 79 is Alien, isn't it? Yes. Um, so 77 is Star Wars. You can definitely see that there was an attempt at like pop culture referentialness. There's here. an inspired by yeah, vibe yeah, yeah, that yeah. underlies all of this stuff. Um, and I, the aesthetic in the matte paintings in the background feels very Planet of the Apes, like mm-hmm. original uh, Rod Serling Planet of the Apes, not more modern Tim Burton. There's a bit Planet of, of uh, Fist of the North Star in there too. Like there's some boats shoved through buildings. There's some like, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of like- The visuals, I like the visuals for this are some of my all time favorite visuals in any kind of animated, in, even non-animated. Yeah. Like- and this is all hand-drawn media too. Like so I'm super excited hands. about the new Fallout TV series that's coming yeah. out. I would be thrilled if that big budget 21st century production looked half as good as the matte paintings in the background yeah. of Thunder of the Barbarian, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, they've gotten the whole aesthetic of, you know, wreck, ruin, um, things out of place. Um, most of these characters don't know anything about the world that preceded them. A few of the wizards do. So Ariel is, part of her role on the show is she's far more knowledgeable and better educated about the world that was. Mm, so a lot type. of times she's kind of almost like an audience insertion character where she's explaining things to Thundar and Ukla um, about the world. So one of the things Thundar borrows very heavily from like classic disaster movies, you know how we're like when aliens invade in movies, mm-hmm. they only ever attack famous landmarks yeah, yeah. and tourist attractions yeah. and stuff like that. So every episode of Thunder is set in a different city. Mm-hmm. Um, With something slightly recognizable. Yeah, and there's always something, like in the first episode, <clears throat> not only in the first episode do you see the Statue of Liberty, 
they fight the Statue they fight, of Liberty. They physically fight the Statue so of Liberty. So good. So good. <laughs> but they, they do that with landmarks. They have like Liberty Bell. They have, I think they have Mount Rushmore at one point, one of the episodes. Yeah, like there's, so there's 21 episodes, 20, 19 of them, sorry, are set in the United States. Yeah. Um, so you're going to see like, a, it's, you know, it, it basically everything a foreigner would want to tour and yeah, see. Yeah, a roadshow of all the great A roadshow landmarks. in the US. The thing that I find really funny about the show is one of them, one of the episodes is set in Mexico. So, okay, cool. Like, you know, that's that's next to the U.S. Dip, dip down, yeah. One of them is set in the U.K. in London. <laughs> I don't know how they got to London on horses from the U.S., but... They might have wandered through a teleporter, too. Like, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of technologies laying around. A wizard did it. A wizard a did wizard it. Did there's it. definitely wizards. So, so, so it was 13 in season one, eight in season two, and then it got canceled. It did get canceled. And, and so this is maybe, I think, where we tie this back to the other media that we've done when I did gay media, like House of Hell. Because this gets really wrapped up in the times. Yeah. So this is, um, again, to get into the meta of it. So the perception that, again, I think a lot of people have looking back on it, because there were a lot of cartoons around this time that only got like one or two seasons. Like if you go through Amazon's library right now, there's a ton of TV shows. You can buy the complete series and the complete series is 13. Harsh realm, baby. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I miss you, Brave Star. But anyway, um, what happened with Thundar because a lot of people in retrospect look at it and think, oh, it probably just got canceled because it wasn't successful. It was very successful. It got canceled because a lot of parents groups got up in arms and wrote to the network and wrote to the sponsors about the excessive and gratuitous violence in the show. Now, as you hear me say that, there's two types of people hearing my voice right now. There's people who have never seen the show before and are thinking, oh, that seems weird for an 80s kids TV show. And there's people who have seen it who are, th- who are immediately screaming at the screen, what gratuitous and excessive yeah. violence. Yeah. Like there's zero violence. It was there's zero show. violence. Yeah. The show has less violence than an episode of Super Friends Yeah, does. I think the D&D TV show had more violence in it. And that had very little, because then we had weapons even in that show. And I actually, I, didn't, I never found anything to verify this, but I actually think the reason that it did get its one year run in syndication is I think it came out when the D&D show came out, like mm, in terms of the, syndic- yeah. the, sec- the, the replay. So anyway, uh, the show unfortunately died a completely undeserved death. Despite the two writers having this huge pedigree with Hanna Barbera and getting a million amazing writer friends to come write for them too, because one of the writers in the show is Jack Fucking Kirby, and he did a bunch of the character design, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, um, but yeah, Chuck Dixon, uh, Steve Gerber, Joe Ruby, and Ken Spears are the creators, and then yeah, sorry, what are the other um, writers? Chuck Dixon. There was there was a ton of them for the, the the different episodes, but like when you look at it, it's a who's who of comic book industry people from the late 70s and early 80s. Jack Kirby is obviously the big one. The one villain that reoccurs in the the series is an evil wizard named Gemini, who's awesome for a number of reasons. So the first is, he's created by Jack Kirby. Um, You can tell he's created by Jack Kirby for the second reason, which is he's a dead ringer for Darkseed from uh, from the Jack Kirby era of DC Comics. And the third reason, the best reason, the thing that makes him the greatest villain in the history of television is he's voiced by Henry Corden, <laughs> the voice of Fred Flintstone. Did you imagine? <laughs> and I don't so mean jarring. he's a voice actor affecting another voice. Yeah, yeah. The first time he opens his mouth in the first episode, it's you're just like, Fred Flintstone. that's Fred Flintstone. Yeah. Well, ma. <laughs> like, it's just entirely Fred Flintstone. Like it's, it's funny cause it's this coalition of like comic book writers, comic book artists. And then he's like voice actors from like the Hanna-Barbera Nelvana era of like animation just like in this stew, but it's all post-apocalyptic science yep. fiction. It makes no sense. And it's great because it's this stew and it makes no sense. It's like, what do you want to do? I want to do, I want to do a fantasy story. I want to do a story about a wizard mm-hmm. and night. Awesome. What do you want to do? I want a story about robots clearing out a supermarket. Great. Yep. I want to do a story about somebody fighting the Statue of Liberty. Amazing. <laughs> like this is, this feels like, if, if you can have a positive take on a Coke-fueled fever dream, this is that. <laughs> For a kid's show. All right. Well, let's let's get into some of that then. Let's jump in and do some of the... Because we can't... One of the things that this didn't have, maybe before we jump in, it didn't have an ongoing plot line that ever really emerged. No. This was episodic television, bottle episodes like a wagon train or a Star Trek or you know one of these shows where like you have kind of a self-contained moral and parable. And it's also pre the Reagan lift on 
uh, kids television not having to have some type of el- el- like educational element. So they and all have come, some kind of like moral at the end. And also because it was unexpectedly canceled, there's no wrap up at the end. Yeah. So there, there's nothing to even after the fact try and tie it all back together. Yeah, yeah. So we're, maybe we can do some greatest hits, like greatest landmarks, talk about our favorite episodes um, and set sail. We'll get into the, into the, the moon shattered matte painting. Uh, we're crawling under a broken moon. <laughs> do some bone voyage. Pack your bags and chew off your fingers. It's time for Bone Voyage. All right, so in Bone Voyage, we spoil usually the story. Again, this isn't, it's not gonna be that kind of thing because we're doing a whole series here, but giving away some of our favorite plot beats, talking about the overall, like, uh, I guess, themes that maybe come up and some of the morals that get shown uh, in Thunder of the Barbarian. I think just to contextualize it versus regular television and the TV at the time, because TV at the time was very constrained, especially children's television. Um, this is happening during kind of that moral panic as well as to like themes and, and tones. Um, and this is what makes Thunder interesting. A lot like House of Hell is interesting because it dealt with some pretty interesting topics. Why don't you dive in and yeah, give us so an example. Let's just start off by talking about the basic, um, the basic boilerplate, the basic template for an episode. So the basic template for an episode is that the Thundar, Ariel, and Ukla arrive in a new community. Um, usually there will be some significant either road sign or there will be that significant tourist attraction type geographic feature that Thundar will ask a question about. And then Ariel will do a little bit, a tiny bit of exposition about what she thinks it used to be in the real world, um, which is not 100% accurate in every situation, but it, it, it does a good job of setting the stage. Then they will encounter some people, um, and usually these are people that are being oppressed in some way, shape, or form. Either they're going to be press ganged or enslaved or reduced to goo, whatever whatever it is, by the local wizard who is the head of this fiefdom barony community. Right. Um, Thunder and friends will will go and, and try to put an end to the evil wizard's depredations and free the community. The thing that is important to remember about this, and the reason why for me, um, we'll get more, I guess, get back to this at the end, but why it qualifies as grimdark is there is no idea that when this is over, they're uniting these tribes, that they're bringing them together, that they're leading some sort of resistance. They're literally just trying to keep whatever the horrible thing that's going to happen tomorrow at noon from happening tomorrow at noon. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So, that's our basic setup. So my personal favorite episode is still the pilot episode. It's still the first episode, which it's, in Manhattan. it's going to sound like I'm going off on a tangent again <laughs> because the title of the pilot episode is Curse of the Black Pearl, mm-hmm. but it's not a Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> movie. Um, so this is set in Manhattan. Um, this is this features Gemini in his first appearance. <laughs> Fred, uh, Flintstone. Fred Flintstone as our evil wizard. Um, one of the things he uses his sorcerer's powers to do is to animate the Statue of Liberty, which again, to me, it's just, it's such a cool moment. Like if you see that and you don't enjoy it, what are you doing? Like, are you just dead inside? Like, come on, this is rad. Like this is a barbarian, a bipedal lion man, and a sorceress in a unitard fighting the Statue of Liberty. How does it come alive again? Is it the what is the thing that like animates it? I forget. It's it's like one of his magic because that's yeah. that's the thing, right? They just use their magic spells to do whatever. To it's do not whatever, yeah. it, their mag. All the wizards and because all the wizards are different, all their magic is incredibly poorly defined, right. and it just does whatever you need it. It's to just do the wizard just moment. goes attack them, Statue of Liberty. It's like liberty for all. <laughs> it just comes after them. <laughs> well, one of my favorites um, actually is one that takes place in the Rockies, um, and it's called uh, the episode name is. I was just looking this up. It's called Stalker from the Stars. And I liked this one when I saw it syndicated because this was more of a like horror movie episode of the show. Because what you have is you have this village living in a lakeside amusement park. They're encountered in the wintertime. So it's like one of the ones where their matte painting actually changes because there's like snow and ice out there. And it's an alien vampire that's crashed on Earth hunting and and enslaving or and eating villagers like one at a time. And it stuck with me because I saw this probably when I was in my teens, right, in syndication, as like it was a standout because it was it was actual horror movie tropes. It was a unknown entity. And so Ariel had no idea what it was. There was no kid. They couldn't go to their normal oracle of like, what could this thing be? It's a crash spaceship. 
um, and it's attacking and eating villagers. And what I thought was really interesting about this is it's taking them one at a time and it's made in 81. So this is pre the thing, but it's got real thing vibes. And I thought about that afterwards. I was like, this is a kid's show following yep. all these same themes. And that was one of the reasons why it stuck out to me was they have to first identify what it is, identify where it's coming from, and then go track it down and fight it and basically defeat it in the end. Who does go there? Uh, exactly. And that's and that's such a like that's such a weird thing to have as a kid's show premise is that something unknown from space. And it's one of the only times we get like an alien in this. Like we're far enough in the future that I guess aliens have visited, but like we get an actual alien. It's not a wizard's the bad guy. No. It's just, this is monster of the week and you're going to get hunted. It's down kind of it. like when you're playing fallout, right? And like when you're playing fallout, like you, you know, you've got mutants and you've got raiders and you've got all this post-apocalyptic. Yeah, I get it. Fits within the context of the story, but every fallout game has that alien insert yep. where it's like, Oh yeah. Also aliens. Also there's aliens. Also there's the Zaytans that just show up from somewhere, but this thing's a vampire. It's slowly taking away all the villagers and they get recruited a team style to go defeat it. And that to me was like a, the ones I'm probably going to pick out are going to be the ones where it's like, how is this a kid's show? Yeah. What's the moral lesson here? And the moral lesson, this one was band together and you can solve any problem, right? Like you don't, you don't have to have prior knowledge. And when people work together, they can defeat something that's like undefinable, but that's like, a very strange, not linear premise for, for a so kid's show. So what's interesting to me about this, and, and I, we'll come back to this at the end when we talk about where it falls in terms of our Grim Dark scale and mm. what qualities we think it has of Grim Dark. I'm sure when I said that, you know, that we were going to do Thundar the Barbarian as a Grim Dark piece of media, people are like, that's an 80s kids cartoon. You can't do an 80s kids cartoon as a sure piece can. of Grim Dark media. And the thing to me about Thundar is there's this really clear divide, not just... Like the animation style is part of this divide, like that the background is static and the foreground is where the action is, right? And the foreground is animated and the background is these matte paintings. Well, that's almost, it's almost a metaphor for how this is grim dark because everything going on in the background of every episode is incredibly grim dark. But what's going on in the foreground is a kid's action adventure TV show. Mm -hmm. It's the two things are living... I'm not even going to say in parallel on top of each other in every moment of the show. Yeah. And, and like, as a kid, I think like, and it's interesting because I didn't absorb this as, as a kid. So maybe I was more hyper aware of the backgrounds. You would be like subconsciously soaking that stuff up. Like the destruction in the background, all of the like living conditions of the, the people in the show. Like, it's not like the Flintstones where, yeah, they're living in prehistoric times, but it's just, prehistoric versions of how it's we live brightly now. colored yeah yeah exactly like it's like oh this is the car wash and there's a brontosaurus that's or a you know mastodon that's like like shooting water all over your car it's not that sort of idea of like it's just our world but slightly different this is like a no this is not our world and everything sucks and that's it, why everyone needs their help <laughs> it was and everything in the background is brown and sepia and crappy looking mm -hmm. and yeah like it's it's very effective that way it is all right well i think we're getting into tone poem stuff so I guess we've we've picked some a couple episodes that kind of highlight this for us, um, and we get smacked on the back by some of the wizard's goons. Um, and as we arrive at the wizard sort of enclave, because they always have some kind of lair. There's always some kind of weird wizard lair that yeah. they live in that they like give their 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 exposition from. It's never quite Castle Grayskull, but it's but it's kind know. of yeah, it's, it's never quite the same map painting. They draw some stuff over top of it every time, um, and and we're we're ushered towards it. And as we realize that there's. There's two things in here. There's the wizard's like mad sort of like sketch room where he keeps all of his art and prizes. And then there's the gift shop for when the visitors come, the other wizards come, they want to leave with something. And we have to decide if this is going to be art or product in the dark exhibition. Gallery to the left, gift shop to the right, have your tickets ready for the dark exhibition. All right, so in the Dark Exhibition, we will be basically defining where we think this falls in the landscape of creative media. So was this a product? on the product scale, something's being made to consume and buy, or is this art where people are making something maybe for the first time or challenging it, but they're trying to elicit feeling and that the sales don't necessarily matter as much. Um, so this is your pick. So you can go first. Yeah. So it's interesting because, um, to me, it's very crystal clear that it's product. Yeah. Like it is product. It's being made to be sold as a kid's animated show. Um, but it's interesting because I think, um, contextualizing it as product, I think a lot of people, again, who didn't absorb it at the time are going to imagine it falls in certain places in the timeline that are not quite correct. Like looking back at it in hindsight, I think a lot of people would look at it as potentially like a lower budget or a, a shorter run version of He-Man. Mm -hmm. um, and He-Man came two, three years after Thundar the Barbarian. Um, 
And also after the Reagan ruling where you could use kids media to sell toys. Correct. Because this is pre that. And then the other thing is, is the whole The Barbarian thing. Um, the big The Barbarian piece of, uh, a successful piece of pop culture media would obviously be the first Arnold Schwarzenegger, Conan the Barbarian yep. movie. That came in out in 82. So that was still after this. This preceded all of that. Um, there's nothing hugely innovative about it. It's taking a lot of things that were already popular in like pulp novels and pulp stories and pulp comics of the time. Um, or not of its time, but uh, like of its creator's time. I was going to say, fans, yeah, of like the artist's time. Like almost. the 50s yeah, and the Robert 60s. Yeah, Robert E. Howard stuff, yeah. Uh, to me, more than anything, if you're drawing a parallel with something from its same era, it feels like a kid's version of Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, which is from 77. Mm, yeah. So it's definitely more kid-friendly than that was. Um, but it's also clearly definitely product. Like it feels like a couple of creators who looked at something that they had been inspired, like materials they had been inspired by, this whole kind of uh, science fiction fantasy concept. Yeah, the things that Star Wars kicked off as being and then, a blend. And then created something new. But again, like I said, to me it is product, but it's not inspired by the products that I think a lot of people looking at it after the fact probably mm -hmm. think inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not cynically done. Like that's no. the thing is like, and and so I'm gonna tend to agree with you because it is it is designed to be sold. This was this was definitely Absolutely. a thing that was taking and and because it's iterative on certain ideas like the Sun Sword and even just like the lineup of characters and stuff like that, it has a and it's funny because it's taking applied learning from the Hanna Barbera years that these creators worked on, and also taking a greatest hits of like designers to come help do character design and write for them. You're seeing that it's there to be sold, but because it sits in this time period where they had to still follow certain like creation regulations, it's more constrained than what comes later. It's yeah. not designed purely to sell action figures the way that He-Man is designed to sell action figures. Where like, there's almost no moral lesson or if there is, it's a PSA at the end like in G.I. Joe, right? Yep. Like, you, knowing you, is half the Knowing battle. is half the battle. Like, they literally just don't they, don't, they don't even bother trying to insert some kind of moral message. Nope. They just do lasers, red and blue lasers for half an hour and then do a one minute PSA at the end. So, so for this one in particular, for Thundar, I think it's product, but it's kind of very like, it's conscientiously made, you know yeah. what I mean? And it was being successful at the time, but I think because of when it came out and kind of the era it was in, it didn't have a chance to solidify and succeed because of the like moral panic happening around it. And the fact that it was so weird, like it was, it, it, it did make some, like it's very on the line for me because it did make a bunch of artistic choices. Yeah. I think it's a great touchstone for us because we've talked a lot about how product versus art is not meant to be a value judgment. Yeah. But then we tend to frame it a lot like it is. This is a great example of something that I think you have to look at it and say consciously, this is product, but this product has artistic merit. Mm -hmm. And and I really appreciate that. Like I appreciate the fact that you can do something with the goal of being financially successful with it without being creatively bankrupt. Yep. Yeah, and do it in a very different way. They weren't just making another Space Ghost. They weren't just making another yeah. like Yogi Bear. They were making something that was completely theirs and different. It's a huge roll of the dice. And a hu absolutely, they're trying to set up a new studio basically in LA. So it's funny because there's some and there's some things there that are that are that are very much like uh, designed to make a a artistic ch like choice. But then there's some things that are very derivative on purpose to try and hook the audience, like yes. the, the Wookiee character, you know, I mean the Sun Sword, like stuff like that too. So it, it is very on the line for me. But I do think that you're right in the end because this is trying to make a marketable franchise and succeeds for the most part until it gets canceled because of really outrage. Yeah, moral um, panic. And 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 didn't have a chance to like coalesce into what it could be because there's no like I did some digging. There's a ton of Thundar action figures, but they're all recent. Right. And there's there, a ton of like there's a ton of product now around it as like a cult thing, but not as And there's like a, a lot product. of product that is very clearly inspired by it, but not licensed by it. Mm -hmm. So like I, I mentioned when we did the Precipice of Corruption, um, that for Dungeon Crawl Classics, there's a guy, uh, Sean Reed Filippo, who did a series called Crawling Under a Broken Moon. Yep. Which is just Thunder of the Barbarian, like the an RPG. As as an RPG. Um, I sent you a picture last night of, I just picked up the, uh, the first scientific barbarian yeah. annual, Yeah, which is, um, fantastic. Which is amazing. <laughs> or even the fact that like j just certain tone things, like the fact that there's sorcerer Kings that are in every one of these like enclaves, yeah. like you can see a bit of that in dark sun. You can see a bit of that in like these other apocalyptic pieces of media later on. And maybe they're not directly derivative, but 
it's out there when Dark Sun gets. If written, you want to, you know if you I mean? want to buy a licensed Thunder of the Barbarian product, you're gonna have a hard time finding that. Like that barely exists. Yeah, like I think some action figures than, and Funko Pops. That's about it. Yeah, and the DVD set. I think yeah. that's that's the sum total. And I don't mean the Blu-ray set. I mean the DVD set. Yeah. Um, but if you want to find a bunch of Thunder adjacent inspired by, um, you know, I had those miniatures from Interlocal yep, Miniatures, said, which yeah. are awesome. Which are fantastic. Um, you know, it's out there. Mm-hmm. Well then, let's pick out some themes because what does make this grim dark? We need to get dragged out of the. Uh, I guess I refuse to buy something. You refuse to buy something, even though we appreciate the products and we're just. I'm buying us. everything. You're buying. I'm buying everything. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm buying everything. <laughs> and we get ejected from the wizard's enclave, <laughs> and the local villagers see us raving at the the broken moon because we can't understand how this planet's even functioning with giant giant hole in the moon split in half. Um, and so they drag us off to their safety room where uh, we will spend the night in the grim asylum as night descends we scratch our messages into the walls future warnings for inmates of the grim asylum. all right so in the grim asylum we talk we talk about themes uh, we talk about the overarching sort of like um uh, uh feelings and the tone poem that is a piece of media that makes us feel like it is grim dark uh, and I'll have you kick this one off. We usually pick two or three. They don't have to be the same. Um, and they're from a list that we've kind of started to expand. Like we added brutality and barbarism to our lo- our sort of like um, our, uh, our, 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 our lexicon over time because we identified them later on. So this is a growing list. You don't have to have them, but it's what was what came through the strongest us that made us feel grimdark to us. So I'll have you go first. I'm going to preface this by pointing out that ironically, even though I've used it in two of our last three videos, I'm not going to use barbarism. When describing Thunder of the Barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's ironic. Sure, yeah. I'm just swimming against the stream now. Um, so maybe on that note, my first one I picked was Subversion. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I really liked about Thunder of the Barbarian is, is again, you have this kind of foreground background split. And in the background, you've got the ruins of the old world, which is our world. Um, and in the foreground, you have the modern future world. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really effective, it's funny that the show doesn't have to have a moral lesson mm-hmm. and arguably doesn't really consciously have a moral lesson, but as written, you're effectively watching society rebuild. And I mean, I'm not a historian, but like pick a given period in history, like maybe like the dark ages. Mm-hmm. Um, and it feels like you're running parallel. You're repeating that you're you're uh you're you're living you're you're living the doomed repeating history because you haven't learned from your history right so you've got slavers you've got baronies you have all these things happening and it it's interesting because without being in your face about it it feels like it is making a statement kind of uh, metaphorically about the evil that men do Mm -hmm. but these men just happen to be wizards with robots and living in a post-apocalyptic hellscape yeah so I really liked that. Like I, I, it's so subtle that I couldn't honestly tell you that I'm sure it was intentional. Well, it, I, I think it must have been intentional because my first one I had come through was dystopia, and the reason for dystopia is that you have a series of space wizards basically lording over their their poor like encampments that are nearby, doing whatever the hell they feel like, and that they never get a comeuppance these are a thing they have to deal with every single episode usually unless there's some force majeure like the space vampire yep and like the the reason it's so prevalent to me is i have to think what would i have absorbed from that as a kid that every time they go somewhere new it's never better there's just another powerful person abusing people basically that we have to fight and that this is an endless cycle that we are just we are we've escaped from the one that was our like captor but everywhere we go, there's just another version of this guy over and over and over again. And that's like, that's overt. Like there's not, they're not hiding it. Nope. Every episode, there's a new antagonist usually. And every episode that antagonist is just a version of the first one that they escaped from that's Ariel's father. And it's like, this is a premise for children. Yeah. This is a premise for children like eight to 12. Kids like, got to learn. This, <laughs> Kids got to learn. And this is, in the, this is in the early 80s. Like this is not... This is not a popular thing to hang a show on. No. That's crazy to me that like the world they live in is so hopeless. And I guess the the moral messaging is, yeah, no matter how bad things get, you always do the right thing. Like that's kind of the overarching messaging for the the, the, the main characters is they always try and help. It's the, but, it's the but, raging against the dying of the light. But right? my second thing is going to come back to that. <laughs> so what's your second thing? Uh, so my second thing was decline. Okay. And this ties a bit back to what you were talking about with entropy. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So it's ironic because you don't see decline in the show because you have these static matte backgrounds. Yes, that you do. They're bad, but they don't get worse. Yeah. Um, but the implication to me, again, because Thundar and his friends are not bringing people together. They're not create. They're not. They're not building a new world. They're not trying to trying to rebuild from the ashes. They're just trying to get through the day, get through this particular piece of the landscape, mm -hmm. get away from this wizard. And given that you're looking at what the world used to be contrasted to what the world now is, you know it's bad. You know it's gotten worse. And there's no sign it's ever going to get any better. Yes, you're 3,449 or whatever it is. Things have not improved. Like, no matter how long ago this happened, things have not gotten any kind of better. Dude's still rocking a loincloth. <laughs> yeah, like, right, you know, yeah. go to the Gap. <laughs> Give us get, something that's not a loincloth. Get yourself some khakis. <laughs> there's no khakis coming. So, yeah, I went, with, uh, I went with decline. Because if you look at even our world, let alone the far future of 3994, um... Man, that world is it is moved substantially backwards. It sure has. Yeah, it is not. It is not a. Um, it is not a, a hopeful place. Basically, that you're in. Mm -hmm. Well, my next one was futility, and the reason it's futility is even every episode they thwart some super authoritarian wizard's plans, but they never undo the society. Right? There's never and there's never any thread even to pick up that anything has ever gotten better behind them. They just leave after. Yeah. They just go to the next place yeah. hoping it'll be better. It's not. And then they try and like solve the current crisis and then they leave. But nine times out of 10, that guy's still there. Yeah. And there's nothing really different or changed. Like I think the only place, maybe the space vampire is one of the only ones where they actually like defeat something that's just gone afterwards. They don't actually like, they, they solve that little society's problem and it has like a meaningful impact. So futility is the one for me because it, it's it's funny because it's hard. Well, one thing with kids media is when you do what we're doing right now and you're doing a deconstruction, you sit back from it and you try and like objectively look at what's happening. You have to realize that that's not necessarily the creator's intent. The creator's sure. intent is to, we, we said this was product. They're delivering a short form tone poem about the doing the right thing in the face of adversity. Yep. And you can, you can hold that as being true on one side. But when you do what we're doing right now and you take the whole thing holistically and you go, what's the impact of a kid watching 21 episodes of this? It's got to be like, oh, nothing matters. Wherever they go, it's just, it's equally bad. And whenever they do anything, they just solve like the current problem. Like that's what you're going to absorb as a kid. Right? You're going to absorb that like nothing's ever better. How to be a nihilist in 21, 22 minute episodes. Or a martyr. Like I'm just going to do the right thing forever. Like what kind of PTSD does Thunder have at this point? That like wherever he goes, it's just shit. He went to London and everything's still terrible. All these landmarks are just turned into like these weird like super villain hideouts. If I recall correctly, when he went to London, London Bridge was falling it down. It was literally falling down. Yeah. So it, to me, that futility came through over the course of these 21 episodes where like, because there's no like plot line basically to resolve, there's no like, there's yep. no, uh, there's no uh, Mumra, you know what I mean? To eventually defeat, yeah. like there's no like primary. There's no Cobra Commander, there's yeah, no there's Skeletor. Nothing, there's, no, there's no, there's nothing to like overthrow. You don't ever see anything get better. And so it just feels totally futile. I would be, what's your next one? Uh, so for my third one, I did fear. Um, so it's funny because the, the character, the three main characters are, are effectively fearless yeah. throughout the entire yeah, run of the yeah. show. But in every episode, there is the three main characters, there's the villain, and then there's all the people. And all the people in all the world, with the exception of the three main characters and the wizards they encounter, live in a constant state of fear. Like everywhere they go, with almost without exception, the people are hiding either from the wizard or from whatever the wizard's plan for them is. They all live in the shadows. They all they all huddle in ruins. They are all trying to avoid detection and being noticed. Every single person, like what defines the difference between the protagonists in this and the background characters is that the protagonists are the only ones that don't seem to live in a constant state of fear. Of absolutely just shaking basically terror that something bad's gonna happen to them because they have this overlord that's gonna be there forever. Yeah, and that comes through like, you. So I came at that kind of a different way. Mine was hopelessness. When they show right. up to every single one of these places, the people are completely broken. Yeah. And they're like the salvation that arrives to try and like fix things for them. And they and they are immediately clung to in that way too. There's always some like, like save me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope kind of moment with them in every single episode. And that, sh and that, and I think that just builds up to then the futility of what they do and the dystopia that they're living in where 
21 episodes later, nothing's better. They're just solving everyone's problems. Like they're going to get so worn out by doing this. They are, they are the cool guys walking away from an explosion without looking back. It's still exploding behind you. You're That's just right. not looking back at That's it. That's right. And, the, and that, that whole little is Tobo like on the road again at the end of every episode. It's like, maybe, maybe tomorrow we'll learn to settle down. Maybe tomorrow it's like, nope, the problems here are just as bad. <laughs> oh no, it's a robot octopus this time. I guess we got to go fight that. Like, could you imagine just how defeated Thundar must be on the Like, why is nowhere just like, why is there just trees? Why can't I just settle down? Down. My loin cloth's getting real tired. It's getting real dirty. <laughs> getting real dirty down here. This is even like a place I could buy a new loin cloth. I'm gonna have to, gonna have to shave Ukla again where to get he, some new clothes. Yeah, where does he recharge his sun sword? Like that's what I want to know. How does that thing even work anymore? It's gonna run out eventually. That's a good question. That's a good question. I don't know how he recharges sun sword because I mean there is. It's funny because like it's the year 34, whatever. But like. There's streetlights still working every now and again. Like, yeah. there's still, you know what I mean? There's like a little bit of infrastructure going on somewhere where like you see that there's a bit of power, a bit of electricity. I don't know who's running any of that stuff. Nuclear batteries. Department of Water and Power from Tank Girl. Could be. Could be Malcolm McDowell. You know what? At the end of every Yeah, it's at, always Malcolm it's always McDowell. McDowell. Yeah. yeah. At the end you of every your own question. At the end of every apocalypse is a Malcolm McDowell. We've proved that at least four movies. <laughs> If you can tell me the four movies in the comments, I will have great respect for you. Which four movies? The end with a, a post of Malcolm Malcolm McDowell. We've covered one of them. <laughs> so um, I guess we've I guess we've gone through and we've picked out our themes. So now we have it comes the time. We have a pile of mock skulls that we found. Oh, Ukla's, Ukla. Ukla's family. Ukla's very making. He's making sad Ukla noises. He's like, Whoa. oh, we didn't even we didn't even do the factoid about Ukla's name. Oh yeah. I forgot about it. So they didn't Which they didn't, was new to both of us. We didn't realize this. They picked Ukla's name by walking next to the UCLA campus and be like, just call him Ukla. That's so funny. Which I love. I love that I too. I love it. That's such a stupid fact. What do we call the Wookiee guy? I don't know. We gotta call him something weird. They just What's written me. on that sign over there? It says Ukla. Okay, yeah, we'll call him Ukla. <laughs> No, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, so we gotta pick some, we gotta pick where this sits in the landscape of Grim Dark Media. As the light fades and the end draws near, where does this sit upon the throne of skulls? See, like a little we can red see circle. it recording now. Which I'm pretty sure is the <laughs> 1979 symbol for recording. So I think we're yeah. good. I like that we're back now, not with a stock image of me because I was, for some reason, the B camera didn't start. This uh, is going to be how they all figured out that I was a serial killer and I'd killed you. And I was just, because <laughs> that's, that's why there's so much repetition in what we talk about is I'm just, I'm just taking clips, like cutting out letters from a newspaper, adding them back in. I don't know why the B camera didn't start. I swear to God it started, but we talked for like an hour. So you guys get to. So see anyway, ghost chip, MF Stop. doom, whatever. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> just a random picture of Ash. Um, so Grim, this is Throne of Skulls. Throne of Skulls is where we do the um, the ranking, basically, where this sits for us in our landscape of Grim Dark Media. People have asked before, like, is this, like, the grimmest to the darkest? It's more like, is it our personal preference? The answer is yes to all these things. So Yes like, to all of them, also no to all of them. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, we're just two guys on the internet. Like, who gives a shit what we think? This isn't... This all of you. Yes, all right. of you. That's right. You Hang on my every word. <laughs> That's right. This is the important <laughs> thing that you're going to hear today. And we're at Lucky 13. This is our 13th piece of Grimdark Media. Um, we did have one, for me, a disqualification. I disqualified World War Z. It was my 13th as Grim Dark Media. It is also my 13th, it is but it's on my list. But it's on your list still, yeah. I thought it was too hopeful. It's on my list for seven more weeks. For seven more weeks? Amazing. Until it drops off. <laughs> and, then, and then after that, something else will drop off. Uh, and then my number 12 is The Rangers of Shadowdeep. Uh, for 12, I've got The Last of Us Part 2. You sure do. Uh, so then what comes after that? Oh, for me, 11 is Astartes. All right, well, 11 for me is going to be Event Horizon. I keep forgetting that that low i know it bothers me so much i know uh 10 for me is house of hell uh 10 for me is the book of eli nine for me is roadside picnic nine for me is thundar the barbarian well, we're not too far apart then because <laughs> eight for me is thundar the barbarian well, and 10 for me is house of hell because this is this is the like or sorry eight, um, eight for me is house of hell because this is where i've got my like my childhood forming trauma basically tv shows this is where i put it uh, seven for me is Book of Eli. Seven for me is Hard Boiled. Uh, six for me is Rangers of Shadowdeep. Six for me is Astartes. Five for me is Event Horizon. Five for me is The Precipice of Corruption for Dungeon Crawl Classic. Uh, four for me is Hard Boiled. Four for me is Roadside Picnic. Three for me is The Precipice of Corruption. Three for me is The Call of Cthulhu. Two for me is The Thing. Two for me is The Last of Us Part Two. And one for me is Call of Cthulhu. And one for me is the thing. So I, I think this 
fit pretty much in the same spot for us. This is yeah. the thing where we were like, this is so of its time. It's entirely a like gamble on the on the thing of the creators. And it would never be repeated really for kids in media. I can't think of any analog to this. No. That is as dark and as grim that was made for this age group in like cartoons and Because everything else you think that's like this, either like, you know, like a He-Man, where it is nowhere near as dark as no. this. Um, and then you look at something that is as dark as this, like something like a, like a Wizards, and it is not for kids. It's for adults. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So there's like, a, there's an element of like, how did this get made? Why did this get made? Oh my God, it actually succeeded. And then later on in life being like, how did we watch this? And not be like, just it's messed funny. Up it's funny it. though, because like, we're all, you know, we see all these ads for different streaming TV shows and movies and stuff. And I feel like, I feel like this is what we're chasing. And I don't mean Thundar specifically, although in my case, I mean Thundar specifically, <laughs> but I mean, broadly in general, something that is interesting and unique and doesn't feel like it's, it's, it doesn't feel like it was cooked up in a focus group. Like, again, this is product, but it doesn't feel like it was cooked up in a focus group just to be sold to a set group of people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that is the rarity of something like this yeah. where you're like, oh, this is a, this is a, a, a gamble that happened at a time where you could still have like a studio form. Like you couldn't even have a studio get made today like this. You know what I mean? Like a production animation studio. They're all a department, a subsidiary and owned by, you know, it's all been four quadrant developed into making a TV show. Yep. Like you look at any kids TV shows right now, they're mostly makes, remakes or franchises. Like there's every superhero squad Marvel thing that's just yep. Marvel for kids or whatever that ends up being. And then every once in a while you get something like an Adventure Time that comes along. Sure. Actually, sorry. The closest I can think of of something for today's Thunder is probably Adventure Time. Adventure Time is a fucking weird ass show. It is, and might and might get picked for Grim Dark Media. Oh, that's because, awesome. Because Adventure Time is like if you've watched Adventure Time, you know. If you haven't watched Adventure Time, honestly, even at like this stage, like even if you don't have kids, just give it a chance because it is. It is a dark, weird yeah, the, show. Yeah, the aesthetic of the show is not the content of the show. Not at all. No, yeah. not at all. And and almost does it better justice because it makes it slightly more palatable for how uncomfortable some of the stuff yeah. is. Like, like, yeah, I'm not going to ruin Adventure Time, but now that I think about it, Adventure Time is to today what Thundar is to this. And Adventure Time is probably arguably more successful. Oh, I think it's definitely more successful. Yeah, because it survived longer. But it, it was survived also longer. Made, it spawned more actual products. But it was like Adult Swim, so it was like yeah. kind of outside the studio system too. So it got that like it got that free pass for being for kids. And then like if you want to see what the kids that watch Thundar watched when they were adults, it would be like Metalocalypse because yes. Metalocalypse is basically just like a, it's it's Thunder the Barbarian but for adults, <laughs> where it's just totally un stream of consciousness, just unhinged, like yeah. unhinged superstar metal band in a post apocalyptic world, and then Doctor Roxo the rock and roll clown. I do cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> well, greatest, I know what I'm watching when I go home. He's the great. He's the greatest anti-hero I think of of my generation's like animated television. Sweet. So I get to pick next. The crowd has spoken for March for um, game media. We'll be covering more time in two weeks. Interesting. But next week uh, I get to pick book and literary media, and I've kind of hemmed and hawed on this. Um, it is something that like I wasn't sure if I wanted to do another comic book because I like the short form stuff because we can kind of like 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 have it coalesce a little bit better if we wanted another book. Um, there's been a lot of like uh, uh, suggestions and I did Roadside Picnic obviously as my last book media because I'm kind of getting to back to back book medias. Yeah. Um, but I think this time around, I'd like to do something a little bit different because we haven't done fantasy in a while um, and we've done a lot of science fiction. So I think the the piece of like um, Grim Dark Media I'd like for us to cover is going to be The Black Company. Tales of the oh, Black that's Company. interesting. That's not where I thought you were going. Yeah, okay, by, cool. by Glenn Cook. So I you, really so like- So you left my Grim Dark book on the table for I me. did leave your Grim Dark book on the table for you because I, I know you're passionate about it. But I really like Glenn Cook's writing. I really like his universes. And I really like the way that, this, particularly The Tales of the Black Company gets written. So that's gonna be my pick for Grim Dark Media cool. next week. All right, sweet. Uh, so thank you guys for watching. Thank you for putting up with the weird uh, still of me, basically, that had to be through after this, because for one reason, the B camera didn't start, and we're not going to re-record a long form thing like this. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next week for some Tales of the Black Company. Bye, everybody.
Thank you so much for watching another Grim Dark Media. Now, if you want to get your votes in for what's going to be coming up in April, you can do so in the poll on Patreon going up next week. Have a great day, everybody.